The medical patient assessment is one of the most important skills you can have as an EMT and also one of the most difficult to perform. Today, we're going to show you how we teach our students the medical patient assessment here at IMA. Hey, my name is Chris. I'm a paramedic and the EMS director here at Idaho Medical Academy, or IMA. And today we're going to be talking about patient medical assessment. So there are a ton of different ways you can go about learning a patient medical assessment and a, a number of different ways that you can do a patient medical assessment. The way we like to teach our students is with our patient medical assessment skill sheet. You can take a look in the description below to find that link if you want to take a look at it. So when going over patient medical assessment, I like to think of five different major sections within the assessment. We're gonna have our scene size up, then we are gonna have our primary assessment, we'll do our history taking, then we'll have our secondary assessment, and finally, we'll have our reassessment. So we're gonna go through each of those steps individually and talk about how to do all of those. So let's first start with that primary assessment. The first thing that you're gonna do, especially in class, is talk about your PPE precautions and ensuring your scene is safe. You're gonna see everybody do some jazz hands. That's a very common thing in EMT class. All the way up through paramedic school, you're gonna see people doing the jazz hands to signify I have my gloves on and I'm thinking about my PPE. Even on a real call, that's something we really need to be thinking about. And we need to be thinking about our different levels of PPE as we are going to the call. The scene size up doesn't start when we arrive on scene. It starts right when we get our initial dispatch information. So if I know that I'm going to a patient with uh, a respiratory disease like COVID or tuberculosis, I know that I need to be putting on an N95 mask and maybe some eye protection. If you're going to a childbirth, we might want to be putting on a gown or, or uh, a face shield or a, a full set of PPE. Whereas if we're going to maybe a lift assist call uh, or just a minor medical call, then we'll probably be okay with just gloves and maybe some eye protection if you like to wear eye protection on every call. So we need to be thinking about that early to get it taken care of. And when you're in school, you need to let your preceptor or your proctor know that you're thinking of that. And that's why we do the jazz hands and we mention that we are thinking about our PPE or BSI precautions. Remember, PPE is personal protective equipment and BSI is body substance isolation. We also need to be thinking about our scene safety and this is something that should start initially right from dispatch all the way through the entire call. Okay, um, we need to be thinking if there's an active shooter or a violent patient on scene. If you're on the side of the freeway, we need to be thinking about our scene safety then. If we have a psych patient or somebody who may become violent, uh, and we need to be thinking about our scene safety as we're driving to the call. Once we have determined that the scene is safe, next we need to think about the mechanism of injury or nature of illness. In a medical call, it's generally going to be the nature of illness where a trauma call will be a mechanism of injury. Sometimes that can be hard for us to get, especially in a mock scenario that you're going through school. So uh, here at our school, our preceptors will give our students um, some sort of nature of illness or you'll get some sort of dispatch information to know that you're going to a chest pain patient or a shortness of breath patient or whatever that patient may be, you should have an idea of the nature of illness and the mechanism of injury. After that, we're gonna be thinking about our number of patients. Now, obviously most of the calls we're gonna go on are just going to be one patient, especially on the medical side but there are times where that's not the case. If you have a live delivery, after that baby is born, now you have two patients. If you're going on a hazmat call or a CO call, uh, carbon monoxide, then we might have multiple patients. So that's something we wanna be thinking about early on. That way we can think about our resources, which is our next thing that we need to be thinking about is additional resources needed. It's a lot easier to stand up resources early and to call them and cancel them than it is to get on scene and realize we need those resources and now we're behind the eight ball. So if you work in a rural area and you need to get helicopters to fly patients out to a trauma center, you probably wanna be thinking about that early and getting those resources started early. That way you don't have a delay on scene because you didn't start those things right when you thought you might need to. So in general resources, we need to start earlier than later so that we don't get caught behind because we didn't start those earlier. And don't get caught up thinking just about medical resources when we're talking about resources. Do you need the electrical company because there's down power lines? Uh, do we need the gas company because maybe there's a gas leak? Do we need PD on scene? Do we need the fire department for, for lift assistance or for making access into a home? There's a lot of different other resources we may need, we need to be thinking about, 
and we want to think about those nice and early. We also like to talk about considering stabilization of the spine. Now this is a medical patient, so generally we're not going to be concerned about the spinal injury, but it's not uncommon for a medical patient and a trauma patient to go hand in hand. So maybe a patient had a syncable event where they passed out and they fell down, and now they have some neck pain and they will need that spinal, that spinal precautions. So we want to be thinking about that as well early on, just so we don't forget it when we get on scene. Most of the time in a medical call, it's not going to be necessary, but we don't want to not be thinking about that and forget about it and the patient suffer an injury or further an injury because we didn't do the precautions we were supposed to be taking. All right, so that was our scene size up. And now, once that's all completed, now we will move into the next large section and that's going to be the primary survey. One thing to keep in mind is sometimes things change. That's why a lot of us like to do this job is because it's not the same thing every day and every single call is different than the call you had before. So it's important to remember that maybe that scene was safe initially or maybe you just had one patient and those things can change later. So just because we have now gone through the scene size up section of the sheet, we might need to step back and go back to those different uh, steps in there and make sure that we have that all addressed again if the scene changes. So the first thing you want to do is get the general impression of your patient. In the classroom, that's generally going to be verbalized. Uh, we do a little bit of VR here at IMA. We like to maybe um, set the scene a little bit if we can using some props, but in general, it will be a mannequin or another student in the classroom pretending to be your patient. And that can be a little bit hard to get the actual general impression of your patient. And so somebody will have to verbalize it. We like for our students to verbalize that they are looking for the general impression of the patient and then our instructors will give them that information. In real life, you will get that general impression of your patient as you walk on scene. You'll see what condition the, the house is or the apartment is or whatever, uh, whatever place they are when you find them. You're gonna see the patient positioning. You'll see some skin signs as you walk in. Maybe there are pill bottles next to them. Um, maybe there's a syringe next to them. There's all sorts of things that you will see visually when we walk on scene. And that's the very first part of our primary assessment. It's just that visual scene size up as we sweep through the room and the house and the entire scene to get that information as we're walking in. You may be able to get most of the information you're going to need for the call within 30 seconds just visually as you walk in. Now keep in mind, if you're new to this, this takes a lot, of, a lot of practice and this is really a learned skill to start to recognize those things. So if you're a new EMT and you're watching this just to refresh on how to do a medical assessment and you're struggling with it, don't worry about it. It does take a lot of time to start to pick up on those little things. But you'll see experienced EMTs, experienced paramedics will be able to walk on scene and make a pretty good determination of some, some basic guidelines of what's going on with that patient usually just visually within about 10 to 15 seconds of seeing them. And that's gonna be their general impression. After that, we're gonna look at the patient's level of responsiveness. Now we like to use the AVPU scale here for our students. And if you remember, AVPU is alert, verbal stimuli, painful stimuli, and unresponsive. And remember, this is, this is where they stay after we have done those things. So if you say a patient's name who is initially not responding to you and they open their eyes and they look at you, but when you stop talking to them, they close their eyes and go back to being unresponsive, they're, they're not gonna be um, an alert patient. They will be responsive to verbal stimuli only, okay? So AVPU, A is going to be alert, so that will be most of your patients. When you walk into the room, that patient makes eye contact with you or is otherwise aware of the situation going on with all the firefighters or police officers or ambulance personnel, whoever else is in that room, they're looking around, they're making eye contact and they are aware of their surroundings. They are alert and looking at what's going on. For the V for verbal, those patients need some sort of verbal stimuli to become alert and to interact with their surroundings. So that's a patient who's laying there with their, their eyes closed, their head slumped over, and you say, hey sir, hey ma'am, they look at you and they, they respond to you. That's gonna be a patient who is alert to verbal stimuli. On the AVPU scale, verbal does not mean the patient is verbal. If they are speaking, that does not make them verbal. That is responsive to verbal stimuli, meaning some sort of auditory stimuli will make them uh, look around and become more alert of the situation. The P is for painful stimuli. 
And so that's when we walk in, the patient is not responding to us initially, they're not aware of their surroundings. We say, hey sir, hey ma'am, can you hear me? And we don't get any response. And then we need to do some sort of noxious stimuli to see if the patient is roused by that. Uh, we don't like to teach the sternum rub. You might see that out in the field. Uh, that can cause some soft tissue damage, so we stay away from that. Uh, we like some, some simple methods like pinching the earlobe is a good one. I like to take a pen and push it into a patient's nail bed. You just need to do it gently. It's very, very painful, but it's a good way to check the level of responsiveness with pain. Something simple that's not going to cause any lasting damage or any real significant injury to the patient, but we need to see if they are so unconscious that they're not responding to any stimuli or if they will respond to some painful stimuli. And so my, like I said, my preferred method is a pen in the nail bed or a little pinch at the earlobe. Um, but there's, there's plenty of other ways that you can find to do uh, a painful stimuli check. Uh, just check your book out or maybe ask some of your uh, fellow responders to give you some ideas if you're not sure. If you do all of those things and you still don't get any response from the patient, that's when they fall under the U on the AVPU scale and those patients are going to be unresponsive. Okay? So we need to check that first thing, scene size up, and then we're going to check that patient's level of responsiveness just to see where they are on the AVPU or the AVPU scale. Next, we're gonna be looking at the patient's chief complaint and seeing if there's any apparent life threats. So remember, chief complaint is what the patient tells you is going on, unless they are unconscious. If they're not able to respond, then it's a pretty easy chief complaint. They're gonna have an altered level of consciousness, which we can see is their chief complaint. Otherwise, it's going to be what the patient tells you. Sometimes people get confused because they get dispatch information of chest pain or whatever it is, and then they talk to the patient and that's not what's going on. So that dispatch, dispatch information is really good for us to give us an idea of resources that we need or what to expect walking in, but we need to forget about that a little bit when we get on scene and we need to ask the patient what's going on. And that's just a simple question. Hi, sir. Hi, ma'am. I'm an EMT. My name is this. Why, why are we here today? Why was 911 called? What's going on? Can you tell me, can you tell me what's bothering you? Something simple like that should give a response that will tell you their chief complaint. I called because I'm having trouble breathing. I called because my chest hurts or my stomach hurts or I'm very nauseated. Whatever it is, their main issue going on in that, that time when they called is going to be their chief complaint. Once we have the chief complaint all figured out, we need to look at the ABCs or the airway, breathing, and circulation. Uh, it's not a bad idea to remember um, the X ABCs and that X is going to be for external bleeding. Now we're not really gonna be super worried about that because this is a medical patient, but it's not a bad idea to have that always in the back of your head to manage any life-threatening external bleeding before we move on to our ABCs. So if that's, if that's the case, make sure you take care of that. Otherwise, we'll jump right into the airway. And so we want to check to see that the airway is open and patent. The easiest way to do that is talk to your patient. If the patient can talk to you, they're moving air in and out with no issues, they have an open airway. Otherwise, we might need to do a visual check to see if there's anything obstructing their airway or do an auditory, auditory check and listen to, to see if we have any strider or other adventitious lung sounds that might indicate the patient does not have an open airway. So once we have addressed the airway, and we have ensured that the airway is open. And remember, if the airway is not open, that's your first thing to do is to manage that airway. So when we're looking at the ABCs, we need to be looking for these things and we need to be managing life threats as they come up. So if the airway is not open, you need to open the airway uh, and so on and so forth down the A, B, C, and also that external bleeding earlier on. So we'll, we're gonna say the airway is open in this case. Now we're gonna move down to breathing. When we are looking at breathing, we are going to be looking at the RRQ. And so that stands for rate, rhythm, and quality. So the first thing we want to address is the patient's breathing rate. This can be really difficult when you're new and you're not really good at looking at a patient's breathing rate. So don't be upset or be scared if you're really struggling with that. Um, take a lot of time. I like to tell my students that you cannot recognize abnormal until you really can recognize normal. So when you're out in the world, try not to be creepy about it, but try to look at everybody around you, take a look at their chest and try to watch for that chest rise and fall. If you're sitting there with your spouse or a sibling or your roommate or whoever, you're both sitting on the couch watching TV, just look over at them subtly and try to watch for their breathing rate as well. Any chance you can get to try to look at those things is gonna help you to really have a good recognition 
when somebody has an increased work of breathing or they're breathing really slowly or they're breathing really fast. But you're not going to be able to recognize those things very well until you know what normal is. Okay, so make sure that we recognize normal so that we can then recognize abnormal. So looking at the patient's breathing rate, a normal adult breathing rate is about 12 to 20. Most patients breathe at about a rate of 14 to 16. We wanna look for about 30 seconds and count those breaths, and then we wanna multiply that number by two to get our breaths per minute rate, and it should fall in that 12 to 20 range, somewhere around there. Uh, this is where we need to be thinking about ventilating a patient if they are not uh, ventilating appropriately for themselves. And remember, there's a difference between ventilation and oxygenation. Okay? When we're talking about breathing rates, ventilation is the physical act of moving air in and out of the lungs. That's totally independent on how well the patient is oxygenating and what their SpO2 numbers are. This is just, are they moving air in and out adequately? One of the ways we can look for that is the rate. If a patient is only breathing four times a minute, they are not ventilating appropriately, and we need to manage that. The way we manage ventilation rates is with a BVM or bag valve mask by ventilating for them. So when you're doing your, your B assessment on your ABCs, that's the first thing we wanna look at. Are they ventilating well? Are they ventilating appropriately? And if they are not, then we need to manage that for them. So the national registry standards, at least as of the shooting of this video, typically are um, a respiratory rate below eight or above 28 is when we start to ventilate patients. Uh, so if you see somebody breathing once every 10 seconds or so, that's not adequate and we need to help them to breathe with the BVM. And same thing on the other side, if they're breathing 30 plus times a minute, they're probably not moving enough air in and out and we have to assist them uh, and try to breathe with them as they are ventilating so fast. It can be very, very difficult to do, um, but national, regist national registry standards state that that's about the number that we start to ventilate patients on the hyperventilation side. After we address the rate, we need to be thinking about the rhythm. And so most of our patients are going to have a normal rhythm. When we're looking at rhythm, we need to look at regular versus irregular. So regular is a consistent pattern between those breaths. Every, every breath comes about the same spacing uh, from one breath to the next. An irregular breathing pattern will be one breath, maybe a longer pause, maybe a shorter pause, but they're not gonna be coming uh, regularly with that even spacing between the two. There's a couple different reasons a patient can have an irregular respiratory pattern uh, or just a, a pattern that's not our normal respiratory pattern we expect. Um, and we can address those later or you'll hear about those in your class. Uh, but we need to be able to recognize if it's regular or irregular and what breathing pattern that patient is in. After we've looked at that, we wanna look at the quality of the patient's breathing. Uh, and this is gonna be a visual thing for the most part. And this is, can be a little bit tricky because maybe you're not knowing what to look for uh, or you're not good at looking for those things. And so this is gonna be looking at just the overall uh, work of breathing that patient is having. So patient positioning is gonna be important. Are they in a tripod position? Are they in a sniffing position? Are they sitting back relaxed, taking easy breaths? Uh, so look at that patient positioning. We wanna be looking for accessory muscle use. Uh, we wanna be looking for that that tugging around the rib cage um, for that intercostal breathing. Uh, we just wanna be looking at all those different things for the quality of breathing to see in general how well that patient is breathing and how much work they're putting into that breathing. After we've looked at the RRQ, we need to make a determination on whether the patient needs oxygenation. And that level of oxygen we are going to put that patient on if they need it will be based off of those findings we found by looking at the RRQ. So a patient who is significantly short of breath and has a significantly increased work of breathing will probably need a non-rebreather mask or they will need a BVM if they are not ventilating appropriately. If they are having a little bit of difficulty breathing, um, but they're not, they're not really struggling too hard, then maybe we can do a nasal cannula. Uh, but it's really gonna be dependent on what we're seeing for that work of breathing. Uh, and for our students, this needs to be addressed at this point during the primary assessment. That is the reason for the primary assessment is for us to find those life threats and to address them in that time frame. And so uh, for our students, when they're going through those ABCs, when they hit that B for the breathing, they need to address any issues with the breathing then, and that would mean putting the patient on oxygen or giving them a BVM as needed. After we've done breathing, it's time to address circulation. So in our ABCs, that C is for circulation. 
The first thing we want to address if we haven't done so yet is to control that major bleeding if we find any of that. Again, this is a medical patient, so we don't expect that to be the case, but if it is there, we need to address it then. Next, we're gonna look at the patient's pulse. And again, we're gonna be looking at rate, rhythm, and quality, just like we did with the breathing. So we're gonna be looking at that RRQ. The rate uh, is gonna be the same thing. We're gonna check a pulse. We like to count for about 30 seconds um, and then multiply by two to get the patient's pulse rate. And remember, a normal adult patient's pulse rate will be 60 to 100 beats per minute in general. If you have somebody who is a very fit athlete, especially an endurance athlete, they may have a heart rate fairly low compared to that. Um, high level athletes, uh, especially endurance athletes like cyclists, maybe have a resting heart rate in the 30s or low 40s. So uh, you might be outside of that range, but they should be somewhere generally between 60 to 100 beats per minute for that rate. Remember, anything below that will be bradycardia, and anything above that will be tachycardia. So we need to get that rate. So once we've talked about the pulse rate, we need to look at the pulse regularity. So is it irregular or is it a regular pulse? And this is similar to with breathing. Uh, a regular pulse will be coming at a set interval, whereas an irregular pulse will be coming irregularly, not at a set interval. So those, those beats will not be a consistent space between them, okay? Um, it can be a totally normal thing for a patient to have an irregular heartbeat normally. Maybe they live in atrial fibrillation or AFib every day. Uh, and that's a good time to ask that question when you recognize that irregular rate. Either way, we need to check and see regular versus irregular. After that, we're going to be checking for the quality of the pulse. Uh, if we're checking a radial pulse, is that radial pulse strong? Is it weak? Is it bounding? Or is it thready? Those are the ones we're mostly going to be looking for. Bounding, if you haven't heard it, uh, is usually a sign of a very high blood pressure. And so bounding is almost like it's so strong it wants to throw your fingers off of that wrist as you're checking for that pulse. It's bounding, really big, strong beats. Uh, and weak is pretty self-explanatory. So uh, when you feel that pulse, it's a weak pulse. And like I said before, you're never gonna recognize irregular until you know what regular is, or you'll never find abnormal until you know what normal is. So checking pulses is something you should be doing very consistently on every patient that you have, or if you're still in school, on everybody that will let you feel their pulse, so that you can start to feel these normal things. And when you have that weak pulse, it'll be able to key you in. You'll know that it's weak because you know what it's supposed to feel like, okay? So after we've checked the RRQ of our pulse, we need to think about skin signs. And I love to say skin signs are like Shakira's hips because they don't lie, okay? So, um, if we have a patient who's pale, cool, and diaphoretic, that's a really, really profound sign that we need to be aware of because uh, that patient is probably pretty critical. So you'll see a lot of paramedics and a lot of experienced EMS personnel, we really, really key in on skin signs because it can be a very significant finding. When we're looking at skin signs, we need to look at the temperature, the color, and the moisture of that patient's skin. So temperature is fairly straightforward. Uh, put your hand on that patient and feel how they feel. Are they hot as if they have a fever? Or are they very cold as if there's no blood circulation to the skin? So that can be a sign of a patient who is suffering from poor perfusion uh, and probably has a low blood pressure. So once we've felt that skin temperature, next we're gonna look at the color. And we're looking for jaundice, which would be a yellow tinting. We're looking for cyanosis, especially around the lips, uh, maybe in the conjunctiva of the eye. Um, we're looking for all those abnormal colors where we're looking to see what maybe the patient should look like normally and if there's any uh, difference from where they should be normally. This can be a little bit harder uh, if you have a patient with a darker skin tone, but you can always look kind of on the inside of the mouth or in the eyes and the conjunctiva to see if you have any of those skin sign changes because they should show up there even if it's harder to recognize somebody because they have a darker skin pigmentation. After that, we're gonna be looking at moisture. Is the patient sweaty? Are they dry? There is a level where a patient can be abnormally dry if they're really dehydrated. Uh, and we like to use the word diaphoretic if they are dripping sweat. And that's usually a very significant finding. If they haven't been out, if they were out exercising in 100 degree weather, obviously they'll probably be very sweaty. But if they've just been sitting on the couch, watching TV or eating dinner or doing something that is not strenuous, and now they have that really moist diaphoretic skin, 
uh, that's, a, that's a very significant finding, especially if they're complaining of chest pain or something like that. So we really need to look at those skin signs because they're gonna give us a lot of information about that patient and what level um, of distress they're in, uh, just based off of those, those simple little things we can check. All right, so now we've gone through our ABCs, and next we need to get our vital signs or any vital signs we don't have at this point. For the most part, you're already gonna have a breathing rate and you're gonna have a pulse rate because we check those in the ABCs. So on top of that, we need to get our blood pressure, uh, and most of the time we work as a team, right? In EMS, we usually have a team. So you're on a fire engine with maybe three people, possibly four people, or maybe you're on an ambulance crew and there's two of you. For the most part, you're gonna have somebody else, and we like the person who is in charge of the scenario and running the scenario, and we call it teching the call, taking that patient as the lead on that call, will be directing somebody else to get these vital signs. We don't want you to get um, really caught up in doing these, these procedures that take a long time, like doing a blood pressure, and now the whole assessment is coming to a halt as you do those things. So if it's possible, this is something that you'll direct somebody else to do. But we're gonna be getting that full set of vital signs, like I said, so uh, we should already have our pulse rate and we should already have our respiratory rate. So we'll look at blood pressures. We can also look at a blood glucose as well as the patient's body temperature. Another number we can get, especially for a respiratory patient, assuming you have the capability, which is not always the case, especially at the BLS EMT level, is an end tidal CO2 number. Uh, we're not gonna go into what that means now, but if you've never heard of that before, it can be a really good uh, indication of some respiratory issues or just some overall body me uh, metabolic issues. So take a little bit of time, look up end tidal CO2, ET CO2, get some information about that if you're not sure what that means, but you do need to have specialized equipment to get that number. So you might not be able to do it anyways. It's still a good thing for you to have a good understanding of though. After taking the vital signs and doing our ABCs and our primary assessment, we should have a good general idea of the patient's overall priority. Are they a critical patient or are they a non-critical patient? And doing a medical assessment is like being a detective. We're asking a lot of questions and looking at a lot of things, and we're taking all the important information that we're finding, and we're keeping that in our head, and we're synthesizing a picture and an idea of what is going on. So at this point, you should be able to recognize if they have abnormal vital signs, abnormal skin signs, uh, is their level of consciousness reduced? Where are they at there? And you can make that determination on whether this is a high priority patient or a low priority patient. A high priority patient, this is the time to get them transported or at least to start towards that. In real life, it, it can take a long time to package and transport a patient. Maybe they're up a third flight of stairs and there's no elevator. Maybe they're very obese and we need to manage that. So this can, this can take some time, but we need to be thinking about that early so we can start that whole process going down the line. Um, if you're in school, this is where you will tell your instructor, whoever that you're doing your scenario with, that you feel that this is a high priority patient and so we need to be transporting that patient or at least working towards that right now. If it's a low priority patient, that's when we can start to do some treatments on scene. Uh, we don't need to move as quickly to get them going as we would if they're a high priority patient. So now our primary assessment is done. And another thing, like I said earlier to remember, is that just because we have done that primary assessment doesn't mean we forget about the airway or about the breathing and the circulation. Uh, if we have any change in our patient, we need to go back and do an entire primary assessment again. Now, it took me a little bit of time to talk about all this stuff, but a primary assessment realistically in real life with a real patient should not take a very long time. 60 seconds, 90 seconds maybe, you should be able to knock all those steps out. But if you have a patient who has a change in level of consciousness or a change in complaint or anything like that, we want to step back again and do that real quick ABCs just to make sure that they don't have any new life threats that have appeared since we started this, uh, this assessment. So after we do that, next we're gonna be looking at our history taking. This is something that maybe if you have a large crew, you can have somebody take care of early as you're doing the primary assessment, but if it's just you and your partner, this would probably be the time to do it. So it's a pretty simple thing for history taking in EMS, we like to use the SAMPLE acronym. You probably have heard SAMPLE before, if you're in the field or even if you're in an EMT class. Uh, but SAMPLE stands for signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last oral intake, and E is gonna stand for events leading up to the 911 call. So signs and symptoms we're getting by asking all those different questions. That one should already kind of be built in. We should have some of that information already. 
going for allergies, it's just a simple question. Sir, ma'am, are there any medications or anything else that you're allergic to? Coming down to medications, again, a lot of the time you can just ask a patient. They might not be very knowledgeable about what medications they take, or they might take a ton. I've had patients who have had upwards of 40 medications that they take on a daily basis. That's a lot of number, a lot of medications to remember. So ask them, or if you have the ability, you might be able to send your partner or somebody from the, the engine crew or whoever you have on scene to go find those medications so you can get those written down and so you can track that information. One thing that's really important to remember about our role in the long-term healthcare chain for this patient is that we are the only person that will see how their house looks and can get that information from on scene. So if they take 30 medications and they're not gonna be able to remember all of those, we have to get that information by writing it down so that we can get that information to the hospital and to the doctors or whoever's gonna get, get it from there. So after we have the medications, um, next, we're going to look at past pertinent history. And again, this is a simple thing. Sir or ma'am, do you have any past medical history and what is that? Um, they should be able to give you that information. Sometimes patients maybe won't realize information they need to give to you. It's very common for patients who take high blood pressure medication to not tell you they have blood, high blood pressure because they're medicated for it. And so in their minds, it's managed and no longer an issue but we still need to be asking about all the things that they're getting, and we might need to prod them a little bit to get that information. If you're not able to get that information, you should be able to get some of that information based off the medications they take. If you're new, it's gonna take a long time to learn all these at-home medications, so don't worry about it. You probably have a cell phone with Google, and you're able to Google lisinopril. What is lisinopril taken for? And you can see that that patient then has high blood pressure because they take lisinopril. So that's an option that you have in case you're struggling or they're not able to give you that past medical history information. Last oral intake is going to probably be a little bit less important for the most part, but depending on the call, it can be very important. If you have a diabetic patient with a diabetic emergency, knowing the last thing they eat is very, very important. So uh, we still wanna ask that. It's good information to have and good information to pass along. Uh, and then events leading up to the 911 call, Pretty simple thing as well, get that from the patient, you know, what was going on before you called, or if not, we can look for bystanders to see if we can get that information from them. And keep that in mind as well. If you can't get any of this information from your patient, try to look around and see if there's family members or friends or somebody around that can give you that information. Uh, you can also look for medical alert jewelry, those kind of things to look for this information, or you can look at the patient's cell phone. A lot of patients now will put their medical history on their cell phones, uh, iPhones, Androids, a lot of them have a little thing right on that front page to give you that medical information. Uh, and you can look for it there if you're not able to get it otherwise. So after we've done our history taking, now it's time for us to get into our secondary assessment. And this is the real kind of meat and potatoes of doing our assessment. This is where we're really gonna dig in and get a lot of good information. So this secondary assessment is going to be based off of the information we got in our primary assessment in our chief complaint. So if a patient tells us that they have chest pain, we need to do a cardiovascular secondary assessment and look really about the cardiovascular system, what could be going wrong, and ask a lot of questions and do some diagnostics based around that. We're not gonna be going into specific secondary assessment protocols here in this video, but in the future, we will be doing videos based around different body systems and how to do a secondary assessment and a medical assessment on those complaints. You can also check the description below to see IMA's patient medical assessment sheet that will give you some guidelines on how to do a secondary medical assessment for each of those different body systems. After you've done your secondary assessment, you should at this point have a field impression of your patient. Remember in EMS, we don't diagnose. We're not doctors, we don't have all that diagnostic equipment. We're not able to diagnose a patient. What we're going to do is obtain our field impression and what we think is going on. We can hopefully be pretty accurate based off of our primary and secondary assessment, but we can't diagnose a patient with any sort of medical issues. So we will ask a lot of questions, do a lot of things, and maybe our field impression will be that this patient is having a heart attack or this patient is having a stroke. We'll then take them to the hospital so they can have diagnostics ran and they can be assessed by a physician uh, to determine if our field impression is right. And sometimes we might have multiple field impressions just based off of the call. That's okay. 
Uh, and that's one thing that's pretty exciting about what we do here in EMS. We have limited resources to do the same job uh, people might do with a lot more robust resources, and we still need to be able to manage those things. So it's okay if you have a couple different field impressions you think might be going on, uh, but for the sake of school, we're probably going to want to hear uh, exactly the, the number one thing that you think is going on based off of that information you have gotten from your primary and secondary assessments. Once we have our field impression, we need to be thinking about interventions if we haven't done any interventions yet, or if there's more interventions that the patient might benefit from. We might have done some things during the primary assessment, like putting the patient on oxygen or ventilating the patient at that point. Now is the time to think about other things that we might not have done already. So things like aspirin and nitroglycerin for a patient who's having chest pain or whatever those protocols uh, state you are allowed to do. Now's the time to do those things if you think it will be beneficial for the patient and you haven't done those things yet. Finally, after we have done our scene size up, our primary assessment, our history taking, our secondary assessment, now we are going to get into our reassessment as needed. We like to kind of use a metric of five minutes for a critical patient or every 15 minutes for a non-critical patient when we're talking about reassessment. Uh, and when we're talking about reassessment, we need to be thinking about a couple things. The one we always remember that's easy to remember is vital signs. So on a critical patient, I need to be getting a new blood pressure about every five minutes. I should be checking for blood pressure, uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, SpO2, all of those things about every five minutes. On a non-critical patient, we're good for about every 10 to 15 minutes for those things. Another thing we need to be looking at on our reassessment is our interventions and what outcome we are having with those interventions. So if initially you had a patient who was uh, complaining of difficulty breathing and had an SpO2 of 80% and we placed them on a non-rebreather mask, now is the time if we haven't thought about it already to look and see if their difficulty breathing uh, has gotten any better. Look and see if their SpO2 number has gotten any better. Uh, we need to be looking at not just vital signs when we're talking about reassessment, but we need to be thinking about our interventions as well. You don't need to go as thoroughly into your reassessment as you would for say the secondary assessment, but it's a good idea to run through those ABCs again really quickly, look at your interventions, do another set of vital signs and see if what you're doing is working, see if they're getting any worse and what you're doing is not working and then manage those things as they come up. So now our reassessment is done. Uh, if you are in school, that's probably gonna be the end of the medical scenario that you're running. Uh, in real life, if you're out running a call, obviously we might need to redo those steps up to the point that we get that patient to the hospital and we transfer care to a nurse or a physician or whatever equal or higher level of care we are going to be transferring that patient to. It could also be a paramedic uh, or a flight crew or whatever, depending on where you are. But that is gonna about sum up our patient medical assessment. If you have any questions, feel free to re reach out to your instructor or you can reach out to us. Check below to see our, our phone number uh, as well as our website, www.idahomedicalacademy.com. Feel free to look around there uh, or let us know if you have any other questions. Uh, and if you have any suggestions of other things you want to see us doing videos about, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments. We'd love to see those so that we can help you guys out and make you good EMTs and get you through school. Thanks.